us in the room. Jesus came to die for each one of us. If you're in here tonight and don't know the Lord Jesus as you save yourself, prayer that you will trust Jesus before you leave here tonight. We need to pray and believe that God still answers our prayers. So let's every person in here tonight pray as I pray. You pray for those that are lost and need a touch from God. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you that you're still on the throne and that you're still saving souls and that you're still healing people today. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross that we could be saved. We pray for any person that may be here tonight that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that before the service comes to a close that they would trust you Pray for that person that may be away from you, that needs to come home and get closer. Lord, I just ask that they would do that. Lord, every person that needs a touch from you tonight, a healing touch, Lord, we come to you in behalf of them. Lord, we pray for the loss all over our island. Lord, we got a crusade coming up uh, in January. Lord, I pray that you prepare the preacher's heart, the people's heart, all over the side, and prepare our hearts. Lord, maybe we humble ourselves and pray. Lord, maybe see you move, Lord. Maybe see you to move tonight as Brother Perry brings a message. Give him only the words that you'd have him say tonight. And Lord, as a result, maybe see some person trust you as a personal Lord and Savior. We thank you for what you're going to do, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Are right, we going to sing number 420. My hope is built. I hope you know this one a little bit better. If you don't, ring it out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. 420. I want to hear the square. I'm not here. Back me up. going to have a special now. Now a special by the choir. The Broken Rose and then we're going to have a trio. I've got that old time religion.
I got him down in my heart. I hope you got him tonight. We go sing one more. All right, number 99. What can wash away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me all again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious as the flow. Makes me white as snow. Let's come and let's stand and sing that now. Ring it out with all you got. We don't have too many. We want to ring it out. All right, let's do it.
last coming to Blouses with their last selection, I thirst. And after which, my brother Parry with the message for the owl. Now there's a river that flows as clear as crystal And it comes from God's throne above And like a river it wells up inside me Bring in mercy and life giving love. He said, I thirst, yet he made the rivers. He said, I thirst, yet he made the sea. I thirst. I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And what we want to do is deal a little bit about King Solomon and hopefully to apply it as well to the, our hearts, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And um, I want to just take one text first, then we'll go in others, and uh, verse 18. Verse 18 of chapter 2, and there are other verses we'll be referring to as we go on. Verse 18 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. I'm sure that rings a bell, doesn't it? It happens all of the time. No matter what the pursuits are in life, you'll discover that man has to leave it behind. And Solomon recognized this, of course. And then this, this man is a tremendous uh, king. He's the tenth son of David, second by Bathsheba, and is the third king of Israel. And he reigned for 40 years. He also was given another name, Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. He was full, and yet he failed miserably in the end of his life. He was influenced by a great uh, preacher by the name of Nathan, and he was a faithful uh, servant of God. He possessed his father's throne. 
His wealth exceeded that of anyone in all the nations round about. No nation was comparable to his success and to its wealth. Mental abilities, second to none. He was the hope of Israel. He began like a rose, but he ended his life like a thorn. He, he actually penned and preached a thousand sayings and 3,000 proverbs. Yet he was not able to keep them in the end of his life. He gave Israel unsurpassed glory as a nation. He was drunk with success. He inflicted heavy taxes on the people. The Lord only required, of course, 10%. He went way over a fifth. Jesus loved the poor. He took his first step downward. When he married an Egyptian or Egyptian, other foreign women was not just one woman, and this was his downfall. And he brought her gods, uh, that they brought their gods with them. He entertained and he even built it, uh, shrines and houses for them. His harem of outlandish women really caused him a lot of problems. 300 concubines and 700 wives. I don't know in the world what a man would going to do with all of that, but anyhow, that's the word of God. That is what is said about him. At 60, he is called an old man. You cannot help but come to the conclusion that he was a discontented man and yet the wealthiest man in all the world. Self-content, perhaps is a better word for it. No sobs for his sins. That is, not on record. But down in my heart, somehow I get the feeling because a man of such wisdom like Solomon, there must have been moments of repentance. There must have been those moments of deep sorrow where he cried to God. Because he knew how to pray. In fact, his prayer in the dedication of the temple hasn't been surpassed by any prayer, by anyone in all of the word of God. Solomon was a great man and he was a wise man. That's what leads me to believe that perhaps there is there are words penned that are hidden, maybe in some distant cave out in the east. But beloved, be that as it may, he left a son steeped in foolishness. His name was Rehoboam, who was responsible for dividing the kingdom along with Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was the man that took care of Solomon's uh, fortresses. And uh, later he stole the hearts of the people. And Jeroboam said to the people up north, you don't have to go down to Jerusalem. That was the place where the, where the altar was, and that's the place where all of Israel were worshiping. He let them go once, Jeroboam did. But then when they came back, thousands of the Israelites, Jeroboam said, listen, if I keep this up, uh, Rehoboam is going to influence them, and I'm going to lose them. So what did he do? He established two golden images, and he said, from now on, you're going to worship up here in Israel. And that became the greatest division between Israel and Judah. It was one of the saddest things in the history of all Israel. But Solomon didn't help it any either. And his son Rehoboam, neither did he, was able to help. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with myrrh. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Vanity means emptiness. He tried pleasure. Isn't that the cry of the world today? Pleasure, pleasure. And it doesn't have to be sinful pleasure. It could be simple pleasure, and it could steal the hearts of people away from God. And I'm not knocking simple pleasure to the point, but if, if the world is carried away with it, 
in place of the Almighty God and worship of God and being thoughtful of God and the things of God and turning to God because of eternity's values in view as well as eternity's destiny where man will be lost forever in the pit of hell. Then listen, simple pleasure becomes a major problem in the world. We can be drowned by it. Solomon said, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Listen, he said, I said of la a laughter, verse 2, it is madness and a myrrh. What does it accomplish? Here is a man that was also given to laughter, but it was all vanity. This was emptiness. This was a, a superficial laughter. And, of course, it didn't really help. Like I mentioned about the comedian. The clown, the doctor told him when he went to the doctor because of a nervous condition and, and he was very unhappy, and, uh, but the doctor didn't know that he was a clown. He said, why don't you go down to the circus? There's a clown down there that will make you laugh until you're, until you're aching in your tummy. He said, doctor, I am that clown. You see, it didn't help the clown a bit. I said of laughter, it is madness. What did it accomplish? Well, we know that laughter is also a medicine to the soul. Don't get them mixed up now. The type of laughter he's talking about was altogether different. Verse 3, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom, how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. But all of this is vanity. It is said that the, the dining halls of these kings, including Solomon, with you, you, I mean, large dining hall, Ladies, you wouldn't like to have to clean it up after they got through in a banquet the night, I can assure you. It was something out of this world. They had peacocks, several of them, with wine carts going all through the dining hall where they could eat and feast. I mean, just imagine there were days in the small little uh, dining hall of Solomon where 120 sheep, at least 100 of them, and 30 oxen were killed every day. Boy, that's a lot of lamb chops and a lot of steaks. But that's what Solomon had, served at his table every day. And so he said, I tried wine, and this failed. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Look at verse 4. This is achievement. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. And he had it all. I, I made myself gardens and orchards and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. Nothing wrong with this. But this was the thing that he still said in his achievement. He failed. He failed. Art. Gardens. Pools, great works, forest trees, lumber and galore. All of this he was unhappy with. Vanity and vexation of spirit. How would you like, and I don't believe it'll be on your grave because you're not an agnostic like Tom Paine, on his grave was all dressed up and nowhere to go. I got news for you, Tom Paine did have somewhere to go. Sad, sad, and I don't say it with any uh, measure of delight in my heart, but this man poisoned a lot of minds through his philosophy. Thousands upon thousands of people and students who read his books were contaminated, at least they would, had a different thinking about God. They were liberal in their thinking about God, or no God at all, or you cannot know that there is a God. Trust reason, he said, and logic. That's the thing what you, you can get by with, not the word of God. All dressed up, 
and nowhere to go. Do you feel discontent tonight? I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone and you're not saved, you're not born again. We love you. God loves you far greater than we could ever love you. We pray for you. We're concerned about you. We cannot, un we cannot, cannot bear the thought of you toppling over the precipice into hell in all of its fury. And we don't say this in delighting in it. When I was a young preacher, I used to be glad to have whole sinners dangling them over the pit of hell. But I don't anymore. There's great sorrow in my heart when I think of it. And I see them toppling over by the thousands into the abyss. And if they go from the Bahamas, can you imagine what it's going to be like Jesus said, oh, Capernaum, Capernaum, if the miracles were done in thee that were done, would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented a long time ago. Therefore, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Can you imagine? What is it going to be like for the Bahamas? In every street corner, practically, there is a church or some kind of witness We're bombarded with the gospel through television and radio. Thank God for it. I hope it continues. I hope it continues. But think of the rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Bahamas, what it's going to mean and what it's going to cost. What will it take for man to come? We cry to God. You, you come to our prayer meetings in the office, sometimes you'll see what I mean. Or in our private devotions, perhaps, in the morning or night or whatever. Believe me, there is a burden of God's people praying and praying and praying. So, so far, it doesn't seem to be anything happening. If I'm wrong, correct me after the meeting. I believe something going on with God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Have you ever known a time where there's so much sickness in our land? Have you? You say, well, it's a natural cause, Brother Frank. Maybe so. I don't know what answer to give you. But it should jolt men and women into a realization, into a, uh, at least a period of seriousness. There must be a message that God is trying to get across to us. North Carolina and South Carolina didn't expect that awful, awful flooding that they had in that hurricane recently. And the North Florida didn't as well. We do not know where or when it's coming or where it's coming from. Listen, the world is filled with disasters. You can't go to, into a supermarket. You cannot go into a, an arena without the fear of being shot to death. Nine, a dozen, or 20 or more. What's happening to the world? It's out of, out of order. Difficult to calculate anymore. Right is wrong, wrong is right. The philosophies of man is just the opposite to what God says in his word. Solomon proved or tried all of these things, and he failed. And he was not a happy man in all of his achievements. Just, just didn't work for him. Here, this is a man who was getting $18 million a year salary. And he had his own gold mine, and nobody has been able to find it down through the century. Can you imagine a man got his own, his own gold mine? He said, all of this is vanity and vexation of spirit, and I'm going to leave it behind to another man. It wasn't wrong what God blessed him with. It's just this poor man couldn't really uh, be content with what he had. And it soured on him. It just, it just seemed like poison to him. He was no longer happy, and he lost his joy. 
Fanny Crosby said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Altogether different than the man that's all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> he didn't have anything. At what, he had a place to go, though. But Fanny Crosby said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased by his wonderful blood in the wonderful. What an assurance. It's not a leap in the dark like Voltaire said. God forbid. With a Christian, it's, it's not a leap. It's a pleasant walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, and I will be with you. He is the light that takes you through the cemetery when a Christian comes down to death. Not a leap in the dark. Because to them, it's uncertainty. No one knows about the beyond. Who can tell that there is a God? Agnosticism, atheism says there is no God. And so they ridicule the Bible, nothing but fairy tales and a lot of contradictions and mistakes. They're wrong, of course. They're wrong. Uh, but Jesus said, I am the bread of life. <laughs> I'm the bread from heaven. Thank God. You know, the temple that Solomon built cost 1200 and $67 billion if you had to build it today. That's a lot of money. But all is vanity, he said, and vexation of spirit. You know, he said I was great, verse 9. He said, so I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Now that is really a pleasure-seeking uh, man. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. That's Solomon speaking. My heart rejoiced in all my labor. But it was all vanity and vexation of spirit. Wisdom fail, how dieth the wise man. As a fool dieth. That is as close that I can read about Solomon where he seemed to mourn a little. How dieth the wise man as a fool dieth? Let's forget Solomon for a second or two. How dieth you? How dieth me? This whole man has been ready for some time. I'm on borrowed time. Beloved, let me tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is we have to face reality. We're not here forever. I know I'm not. If the rapture comes, better still, when we shall be taken out of this world of ours, and we're going to meet in the air, as we said today at, at uh, the funeral service, get our new bodies. Boy, that's going to be a hallelujah time, I tell you. I never learned how to dance, and I don't know a thing about dancing, but I'm going to jump around in glory, and nobody's going to stop me. And you can say, Frank, you know that's against the Bible. No, it isn't. The prodigal son came home, but that wasn't what you call sensual dancing. They were in the house, and there was music, and they were dancing. You know why? Joy, joy. What do you think it's going to be like when you get home to heaven? Man, it's going to be a hallelujah time. It's really something. Glory. Glory for the child of God. And he said, I'll leave it all behind to somebody else. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus said those words. All is vanity under the sun. What about beyond the sun? What about after death when the sun goes down? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, yes, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Oh, thank God. Thank God. For, you know, the word of God is so precious and so pure and so powerful. And so Solomon discovered human wisdom fail, labor fail, the purpose, his purpose in life fail, rivalry fail. Avarice failed, fame fa failed, wealth failed him. All of these things that he tried in his life was a failure. You've heard me tell the story of a wealthy man who 
gave uh, an opportunity to a man, he said, because he had hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. And he said, Tom, as far as you can walk, you could go south if you want, west, come back. All of that land will be yours, but you've got to be here before 5 o'clock this afternoon. He said, are you serious? He said, I've never been more serious. I want to do something for you. But I must warn you, if you are not here by 5 o'clock, you can't claim the land that you walk. He said, that is, that's easy. He said, that's, there's nothing to that. And so he began to walk and walk, and he walked and he walked and he walked. And he took in a lot of land. And uh, he said, I believe I could take another perhaps a half a mile. It might have been a quarter of a mile. And so he walked that, and he said, well, it's time for me to get back. But he didn't, and he actually didn't uh, figure on him getting a bit tired. So he couldn't walk as fast. And he slowed down. He said, he said I'm, I'm sure I can make it. I'm sure I can make it. And when, you know, would you believe 100 yards before the finish line, 5 o'clock struck, and Tom fell flat on his face. He was dead with a heart attack. And the owner of the property stood over Tom. He said, oh, my friend, Tom, my friend, Tom. All you need is six feet long, four feet wide, and six feet deep. Isn't that sad? Just a lesson for all of us to be aware of. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Remember Jesus Christ the Lord died on the cross for you and for me. He gave his life. You need not perish. You need not be lost forever and ever and ever and ever. There is a way out. There is an answer. And he will give you that peace, that joy, that security that you need day by day. Oh, what to God, if there's anybody here tonight, you ought to be jumping out of your seat and calling upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And if on television you're hearing this message, don't turn the dial off. This could be the most important moment in your life. Give your heart to the Lord Jesus. And don't end up a life of futility, insecurity, and saying like Solomon, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And that's why so many people take their lives because they want to end it all. What is life? Most of them say there's nothing to life and they commit suicide. It's really sad when you think of it. And so many are doing it. I never thought I'd ever see the day where there be th those. I don't know what the percentage is, but in the Bahamas, taking their lives. Would to God that they'll understand that God loves them, Jesus loves them, and uh, he's always there to help them and to encourage them and give them hope. If you're listening to the message tonight, I sincerely trust that you'll understand this. Christ won the battle for us, and we can rest in it. Many years ago, I remember reading about Wellington with his army against the enemy. Uh, was it Napoleon, or was it the Armada? In any case, he got, they got on top of the uh, temple of one of the chapels with an with old semaphore system that they had in those days. And the news came, Wellington defeated. Though England was in such a sad state when they heard that news. But then it was because of bad weather that apparently came between. And so the message of the cinema four was sort of interrupted. And then it cleared. 
about an hour or two later, Wellington defeated the enemy. <laughs> and you can imagine the change in the hearts of the people of England when they heard that. But no weather's going to interfere with the message that comes from Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. I can assure you, no bad weather, no. There might be some ill preaching, might be bad philosophies that will hinder to a degree, but they're not going to stop the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to go forth. Men have gi given and hazarded their lives for the sake of the gospel, and they're still pounding the pulpit, and they're still sounding forth the most glorious message the world could possibly hear. Jesus saves. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? He's in the saving business, my friend. And I want you tonight to turn to 240 and sing a verse or two of that beautiful hymn, 240. And uh, when I say beautiful, it has words, of course, of solemnity in it as well. But you need not be lost. It says, out of Christ without a Savior. Oh, can it be? Can it be? Like a ship without a rudder on a wild and stormy sea. Oh, to be without a Savior, with no hope or refuge nigh. Can it be, O oh, blessed Savior, one without thee? dares to die. We're going to just sing verse 1 and verse 3. Verse 1 and verse 3. I want you to stand and sing with me, please. It's message 240, verse 1 and verse 3. And a short prayer and the meeting will be over. for prayer, maybe speaking to someone here tonight and you're saying, oh, Frank, what you're saying tonight is true because it's from the Word of God. Here's a someone that the Spirit of God can challenge you just to step out of your seat. Maybe you're, you're a professed believer, but you're away from the Lord and you want to really come back tonight. Why well, we'd love to have prayer with you up here to the front. Just step out of your seat and come away. It won't save you, we know, but it certainly will be a beginning of that first step you take. Or right in your seat, you've done it. Then just come and let us know that you're saved, all right? But I, I pray, I pray that you're going to do it. I'm going to ask for just a moment of silence, and then I'm going to pray. Why was silent, head bowed, no one looking around. It's just someone just step out of your seat, young, medium, age, or old, no matter what it is. You need the Lord. You need to come back to him. You need forgiveness. Just step out of your seat and meet us here to the front. Will you do that?
Father, how we pray tonight that the blessing of your word by the Holy Spirit will indeed convict of righteousness, of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. Let there be those who will bow. Let there be those who will capitulate uh, to the claims of Christ. Our prayer is, O oh God, that not one dare to let this night go by without trusting you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious name.